listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast, Episode 33. By seeing more in me than I saw in myself, they were people who helped those moments of insight happen. One of them asked me to take part in a research project that I never imagined I was qualified for because, again, first person in my family to go to college, I didn't see myself as any kind of scholar or researcher. But in the course of that research project, I slowly, slowly came to the understanding, oh, I'm actually doing it. You're listening to the Life Purpose Advisor Podcast. Life Purpose, Spirituality, Higher Calling, Personal Growth, Meaningful Life. We ask the deep questions about living a balanced life of meaning, purpose, and joy. Passion, know thyself, be mindful, spiritual practice, aha moments, life lessons, balance. It is time to welcome your host, Angie Swartz. Today, I'm in awe of the ability to connect with people that you might never connect with in your everyday life. And today, it's my pleasure to bring you Parker J. Palmer. Parker is the founder and senior partner of the Center for Courage and Renewal, a world-renowned writer, speaker, and activist who focuses on issues in education, community, leadership, spirituality, and social change. He has reached millions worldwide through his nine books, including Let Your Life Speak, one of my personal favorites, The Courage to Teach, A Hidden Wholeness, and healing the heart of democracy. Hello, Parker. Even though I'd love to call you Mr. Palmer, um, welcome to the show today. Hi, Angie. It's very good to be with you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming today. I see here in, in your long and distinguished bio that you have a PhD in sociology from the University of California at Berkeley, which in itself is a big accomplishment, but as well, you have 11 honorary doctorates. Is that true? That's correct, yes. I've learned, incidentally, that giving an honorary doctorate is a good way for a college to get a free commencement speech, so I'm not overly impressed by that. Well, you must be pretty good at commencement speeches and a very sought-after speaker. Well, I've done a lot of speaking. I'm 76, so I've had a lot of time to spend on the road and uh, have made my living speaking and writing and teaching for for many years now. Very distinguished bio. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on today? Well, uh, two things. One is the most recent book, which you mentioned, Healing the Heart of Democracy. As you can imagine, uh, that topic is very alive in our country right now. And I find myself doing a lot of platform talks and also small group work around the country with citizen groups that uh, would like to heal the heart of democracy. And in addition to that, I um, remain very active with the nonprofit I founded, the Center for Courage and Renewal, which has now been up and running for 25 years in one form or another, Uh, We have uh, 240 facilitators around the country. We have probably worked with something like 80,000 people in long-term retreats, Um, the aim of which is to help uh, various folks in our society, especially people in the helping professions, to rejoin soul and role. Um, Another way to put it is to help them bring their personal identity and integrity more fully into their uh, personal, uh, professional, and public lives. So that's very satisfying work. It's legacy work for me. I have wonderful colleagues, and I'm I'm very devoted to that. Why wouldn't? Why are we? Do we have such a problem with that? With bringing our soul into our personal lives and our work? Well. It's a great question and and in some ways a complicated question, but I suppose the simplest answer is that unfortunately in our, in our world it's risky to do that. Um, you know, we, a lot of us are taught from a very young age, don't wear your heart on your sleeve, um, or, you know, play your cards close to your vest. We have all these folk sayings that really are about hiding out behind a wall, living what I call a divided life. Um, And uh, I think there's simply a lot of fear involved, which 
Some kids sadly pick up at home, but a lot of us pick up in school. Uh, this dawning recognition when we're very young that if we were to show up with our true values and our true identity, we'd we'd somehow start losing our perks. So we play our roles, but tuck our souls away. And I and I think what the losers in that are certainly, first of all, ourselves, because I can't imagine anything sadder than than uh, growing old and dying with a sense that I never showed up in the world as my true self. But you know, the losers are also the people we want to serve, uh, our students, our colleagues, our our patients, uh, the public at large, whatever whatever population you're serving, they lose when people are phoning it in and not showing up as uh, full persons in whatever their practice may be. Our institutions lose, our society loses. So we need to work hard to break through that uh, that fear barrier. You know, just to take one quick example. Um, uh, I think a lot of Americans are very turned off by our political process right now because they look at our political leaders and they say, what we see is not what we get. There's a divided life that's being lived by people in power who are saying one thing when they're on stage and doing something else when they're backstage. So there are a lot of big losses involved, and this is a problem that needs to be work on, worked on for everyone's sake. Does your research include the statistic of how many people that you believe live or what percentage of people live a fully lived life? Um, I, I don't uh, have that kind of research. I, I'm not sure I've ever seen a, a study that attempted to, to measure that. But what I believe is that, um, you know, we're all at some point on the continuum from a radically divided life where we're really hiding out and not wanting to show up as we are, through that sort of middle passage of, of pain, which people come into when they when they experience the the uh, the suffering that comes from dividedness, as, as I said, not showing up in the world as your true self uh, is eventually an, an unbearable thing for human beings, and if if people are awake and aware of that. Then they get to work trying to bring their inner and outer lives into into greater congruence. Um, and some people go quite far down that road. I think a lot of the liberation movements uh, would be uh, exemplary of what I'm talking about. I sometimes I sometimes talk about the decision to live divided no more as the Rosa Parks decision because. Uh, she exemplifies for many in our culture uh, that that moment in a person's life where where you say I'm no longer going to act on the outside in a way that contradicts what I I know on the inside the truth of the fact that I'm a full and worthy human being and I'm going to bring my full self to this and of course in Rosa Parks's case that that meant not getting up from a seat that she had every right to and. She was one of many who helped spark a great revolution, bringing bringing more health to our society. Uh, so I think we're you know we're spread out along that continuum, and I think most of us sort of move back and forth on that continuum uh, day by day. I mean, I always say the decision to live divided no more is not a once and for all decision. We're always being confronted with new circumstances where we have to decide again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned when we get to the point of suffering, do you think that happens at a certain age range for most people in life? Well, um, again, I, I'm, I'm, I think from my experience that uh, it can happen across a range of ages. Let me take, for example, um, young people, teenagers, um, um, and maybe preteens, who know inwardly, let us say, that they are gay or lesbian, that they have a sexual orientation that's dangerous to reveal in a, in a society which is still homophobic, although I think we're, you know, we're making progress on that legally. Um, but those there are young people who... Uh, come out as gay or lesbian people who, and in that action, they um, 
they declare the, the Rosa Parks decision. Um, I'm mm-hmm. trying to live an undivided life. And I say power to them, and I say we ought to all be supporting them and encouraging them. And then there are other people, I think, who who get into their 40s and 50s and and say, what's wrong? Um, you know, why is it that I'm I'm feeling so far removed from the self that originally came into this world, from my birthright gifts, from all those things that once called to me and enlivened me, um, and they start working on the undivided life. And then, sadly, I think there are some people who age and die without ever really uh, facing into the pain they've carried for a long time that that comes with dividedness. And, of course, all along the way, um, this society provides plenty of, of anesthetics or sedatives to... Uh, in, in a futile effort to ease that pain. So you have everything from over busyness to substance abuse to um, spending 14 hours a day in front of cable TV. Um, I think it's a real mix, as are most things human. Why do you think that is, that some people live their life and never wake up, so to speak? Well, you know, I, I think I think there has to be a, a high degree of, first of all, uh, intentionality um, about sort of diagnosing your your own condition. Um, uh, Socrates said a long, long time ago that the unexamined life is not worth living. And so this this is an ancient human problem. He was clearly addressing folks who, uh, even in his time, uh, the ancient Greeks who were not examining their lives. Um, and, 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 and as Kurt Vonnegut was fond of saying, so it goes, um, that we, there's a certain spiritual laziness, I think, um, and a certain fear of facing one's self, uh, the fear of what am I going to see if I really take a close look at who I am and how I'm, I'm living. Uh, that that keeps people away from this awareness. And as I said, with all the sedatives handy when you can flip on the TV or lose yourself in your computer screen or engage in substance abuse uh, or just time-wasting activities, um, yeah, there's, there's a fear of, you know, what, what if I slowed down long enough? What if I spent enough time in silence? What if I entered into deep conversation with some people I trust, what would I find out about myself if I did that? And I think, you know, most of us are going to find out some things that we do really don't want to look at. But in my experience, looking at these things uh, is always worthwhile. Um, as you know from my writing, Angie, um, and this is something about which I've been very public because I think it's important to be public and I want to show up in the world as myself. Um, I've experienced as an adult three profound uh, passages through clinical depression. And those deep dives into darkness were part of what um, compelled me to look more closely at how I was living my life choices I was making, things I was ignoring, a pain that I was trying to stifle in one way or another, which, when ignored, can come out in, in things like clinical depression, as, as well as, as other forms of, of unwell now. Um, so I know from personal experience that it's tempting to try to avoid all of that, but I also know from personal experience that facing into it, walking through it, um, coming out the other side is profoundly rewarding, although one certainly needs help along the way. I, there's no way I could have done all of that by myself, even though solitude was an important part um, of the process. Would you say that you've had great teachers in your life that came along at just the right time? Absolutely, I would. Um, I think I've been extraordinarily blessed that way. The first great teacher I had was my father, um, and 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 
uh, over the years, I um, found mentor after mentor in high school, in college, in graduate school, and even on into my 30s and and early 40s. Um, these these happened in my case to be all men. Um, and they were older men who, in one way or another, sort of saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and helped evoke that. In other words, the, the teaching that they did uh, was not so much uh, downloading information to me as uh, helping me uh, draw out, which is the, the, the root meaning of the word education, to, to draw out, helping me to draw out my true self and to draw out my gifts and and really to challenge me to use those gifts in the world. Um, the, the piece I always like to tell about is that in my early 40s, um, I, I sort of ran out of mentors. They weren't showing up anymore. And for a while, I thought, what's wrong? What's, why is the universe not collaborating with me anymore? And then, as it were, I woke up one morning uh, saying, oh, right, it's now my turn to turn around and be a mentor to to someone else, to members of the rising generation. And I've really tried to do that over the years. And and to this day, I value deeply the, the kinds of engagements I've had with with people in the under 40 age group, um, which are so encouraging and renewing to me. And they, bless their hearts, uh, seem to value some of my experiential knowledge as well. So men- being mentored and mentoring are two of the great, of, of the great opportunities of, of life. Mm, mm-hmm. And perhaps those under, or those 30, 30 age folks, under 40 age folks were actually mentoring you while you were mentoring them. No question. It's very much a two way street. I, uh, give you a quick example. So a couple of years ago, um, on behalf of my organization, the Center for Courage and Renewal, I invited a group of uh, 30-something people to my home for a few days. We sat around and uh, talked about or learned from them about best uses of the digital world, the, the Internet technology, in the work that we do at the center. And it was enormously instructive because these young people virtually grew up with devices in their hands, and they know so much about online connecting and communicating that my generation doesn't know. But I said to them at one point, um, you know, as we talk, I feel this image comes to me that I'm at age, I think I was probably 70, 73 then, 74, something like that. I said it. At my age, I feel like I'm standing somewhere down the curvature of the earth where I can't see the horizon that you can see from where you're standing higher up on that curvature. So I need you to tell me what you're seeing, tell me what you're hearing, tell me what's coming at you, because it's coming at me, too, whether I know it or not. Uh, and I said, incidentally, I need I need you to to tell me about that clearly and distinctly because my hear- my hearing isn't all that good anymore, um, which brought a laugh. But they, of course, said, well, you know, thank you for letting us know that we're mentoring you, but please know that you're mentoring us as well. And sometimes, you know, for an older person, the mentoring you can do for younger people is simply – is, is as simple as being interested in them, uh, because I think so many older folks are scared of uh, conversation with the younger generation. You know, they, older folks feel like they don't know the music, they don't know the words, they don't know the dance, and that can be a little daunting. But I guarantee you that that the benefits are felt on both sides, and that not only young people but any human being on the planet is absolutely delighted and and thrilled by being asked, what's your story? Tell me about your journey. What do you know? I want to know what you know. 
And that's such an honoring question, isn't it? Mm, you're letting them know that you see them. Right. Back to your point of living an authentic and true life. You see, you see what they're bringing and their value. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the great wounds that people walk around with is feeling invisible. Mm-hmm. Invisible and unworthy. I talk with a lot of people who who feel unworthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, like unseen, unheard, un, unworthy. Exactly. So and so we can we can make a difference every day in our lives by seeing people, listening to people, and affirming people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And knowing, going back to what you said earlier, knowing that there's more to them than what their title is or how they're how they're showing up in a business suit or whatever they're doing to to run their lives oh, that, that there's more more to them absolutely i mean it's it, it's huge isn't it what, how much more there is i mean in my organization i always tell people that before i lead a retreat with a room full of leaders i refuse to look at their resumes the ones that they sent in when they applied for the retreat because I don't want to be looking at people and saying, oh, you're a CEO or you're, you're this or you're that. You're a philanthropist or you're a venture capitalist. I, I want to look people in the eye and just get a read on who they are as human beings. Um, the role, the role stuff, um, I mean, people play significant roles, of course, but it's, it's a, the role you play is a lot less important than what's in your soul. And that's where we both need to go in, in order to connect. And I have found it possible at the, at the soul level to connect with people across all the lines that divide us, you know, the, the lines of race, the lines of sexual orientation, gender, and, and role, religion, political ideology, all of that. When you get down to what it is we share in common as human beings, to the being in human being, then suddenly you find that everybody has the same questions, everybody's wrestling with the same concerns, and that's that's how we can connect with each other. That's in fact part of the part of the solution to our current political dilemma, where we refuse to talk to each other across ideological lines. And um, the result is 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 a god awful mess in our society, a real fragmentation and breakdown of, of we the people. But amazing things happen when you start inviting the personal stories and the the whole question of not what is your political opinion, but what is your experience, your life experience that leads you to believe what you believe. Tell me your story. Do you find that people have a hard time leaving their egos outside the door? Well, I, to some extent, that's a problem, again, for, for everyone. Um, but uh, at the Center for Courage and Renewal, I have to say, and of course you'd want to check this out with other people because I'm biased, but we have developed a process that we call the, the circle of trust approach. I wrote about it in, in my book, A Hidden Wholeness, if anyone wants to, to read about it, and they, of course, can also visit the, the Center's website which it's a process that with surprising rapidity and with profound respect for the selfhood that each person brings into the room, very quickly breaks through um, all of that ego posturing and all of that masking we do. Of course, that, that masking is another name for the divided life, right? Mm -hmm. the, the work that we're doing is really to invite people into something that everybody wants, um, but not everybody knows that they want it, or if they know they want it, they don't know how to get there, and that is the, the state, that, uh, the condition that I call divided no more. Um, so I think there are ways to get beyond ego. Um, and again, the human story is the quickest way to that. I mean, if, if you and I were, for example, to have a political conversation right now, I said, well, what's your, what's your political position on subject X? And you were to ask me the same question. We might very quickly find ourselves at loggerheads 
And then the ego kicks in um, because we both, at the ego level, we both want to win the debate. Um, but if we if we take a different approach and say, you know, talk to me a bit about um, about how you grew up and what you learned about uh, the power of money or of status or whatever, uh, the power of encountering otherness in your life. Um, what were some of the formative events that, that have shaped you in those regards? We can both tell stories that um, will, will, will bring us closer together, even if we're far apart ideologically. You know, there's an old saying that I really like, which is that the more you know about another person's story, the less possible it is to dislike, distrust, uh, dismiss, or despise that person. Uh, I think that's simply and plainly true. It's, it happens in my experience all the time. Mm, mm. Mine too, and I, I love hearing you talk about that. For me personally, I've I've always been that person that, from a, lo- a young age, wanted to know those stories. And my experience with that in my younger life was that people are not naturally comfortable talking about those things with people that they're not close to. So this work that you're doing is so important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, it's very interesting, you know, that as the, as the classic comment has it, um, you know, if, if two strangers on a train who think, who know they'll never see each other again, they can tell some pretty deep stories. Mm-hmm. Two people sitting in a bar who know they'll never see each other again can tell some pretty deep stories. Um, and, and, or the bartender can hear some pretty deep stories. So, you know, there are, there are conditions under which we, we're willing, we're willing to go there. It's hard to do with folks that you work with every day, but it's not impossible. Um, we're, we're, for example, I mean, we, at the Center for Courage and Renewal, we, we began 25 years ago working with public school teachers, K through 12 teachers, because we feel that they, you know, that this society owes them such a debt and that they are doing very heavy lifting that they don't get much help with. So we began working with them. And, um, you know, we found that, that, um, that you know, very quickly they, they came together um, around storytelling, such as um, uh, tell us the story of the first time in your life when you knew you wanted to be a teacher. And people have wonderful stories to tell, you know, some of them involve being six years old and you had a four-year-old brother and you... <laughs> You set up a little classroom and <laughs> taught, taught your brother, you know. Um, and then another story about when did you first know that you were a teacher um, as a teenager or maybe a college student when you realized, oh, I, this is really who I am. So I think there are ways to come at this that are, that are creative and very, very workable. Mm-hmm. How about you? When did you first know that you were a teacher? <laughs> Um, I, I think I, there's some sense in which I knew it all along. Um, that is, uh, I think from, you know, certainly in, in, in high school, I had some kind of intuition that that was my path. Um, uh, but I was the first person in my family to go to college. There was a reticence in me to claim a role like teacher, let alone a, a role like writer or public intellectual and some of the other things that I'm called these days, um, a real reluctance in me, so I could never sort of say it out loud. Um, I went to uh, I went to graduate school at Berkeley, as you mentioned, did a Ph.D., imagining that I would become a college professor. But when I finished at Berkeley, it was 1969, 70, around in there, the cities were burning. Uh, my heroes had been assassinated. Um, and I decided that, I, that academic life was not for me. So I, my next step was to become a community organizer in Washington, D.C., uh, working on issues of racial justice. 
Um, and uh, for a while, in my in the five years I spent as a community organizer, I really I, I grieved for a year or two what I saw as my as the loss of that teaching role that I thought I was preparing for when I did my PhD. But after a bit, I realized I'm I'm a teacher. I can't help but be a teacher. I'm just teaching in a different context as a community organizer than I would be in the classroom. I'm teaching different students. I'm teaching a different subject matter. I'm teaching in a different way, but I'm still teaching. Um, So I think, you know, when you get in touch with your core gifts, you sort of find yourself doing that, whatever you're doing. as As a writer, I feel that I'm a teacher. And I should, I wrote a book called The Courage to Teach where I think I make it pretty clear that for me teaching is not about um, downloading information into people's heads. It's about engaging people in a generative conversation that has as much to do with them and what they know as it does to do with you, the teacher, and what you know. It's, it's a very dialogical, communal, two-way, three-way, four-way street. Um, and, and so, In that sense, uh, you can write a book in a teacherly way. You can give a lecture in a teacherly way. You can conduct a retreat in a teacherly way. And the flip side of that, of course, is that to be a teacher, you have to be a lifelong learner. And um, learning, curiosity, you know, taking a deep dive into stuff that baffles me, that's just kind of a way of life for me. I find it very healing and very empowering. Would you say that you were like that as a child? Yeah, I think I think I was. I was always uh, you know, curious about things. I remember one episode where um, my dad had a man in his office who was uh, a member of the Naval Aviation Reserve and uh, not far from where I lived there was a Naval Aviation Air Base. And so this man, knowing that I was fascinated as a 10 or 12 year old with flying, took me out there one day to, to fly what they call a flight simulator. It, it never leaves the ground, but it feels like it's left to the ground and it feels like you're flying a plane. So this was, you know, a, a highlight in my young life. Pretty exciting for a young kid to get to do that. And when I came home, I decided to build a flight trainer in our basement (laughs) and uh, spent, you know, two years trying to work out all the details of that with wires and batteries and lights and lights (laughs) and gears. And so that's just a a story that that um, I think indicates the kind of curiosity I had as a kid and my desire to to inquire into, to find out about and and then to to make stuff. (laughs) Um, that came out of that curiosity. Um, and, of course, what I've spent the last 40 years making is books, um, as well as programs and courses and, um, and community organizing programs and that kind of thing. So perhaps that was a big aha moment, being in the flight simulator and trying to build one in your basement. Do you think there were other moments that came along in time that were reinforcing or pushing you in a direction to what your purpose was? Yeah, I I think that, you know, the mentors we were talking about, I have to say there, I, I can't recollect any one big aha moment. But um, it was more a cumulative um, emergence over the years. Um, and the mentors we were mentioning earlier, as I said, I, I had one at every stage of my uh, young adult and, and not so young adult life. Um, they, they were people who really, um, by seeing more in me than I saw in myself, they were people who who helped those moments of insight happen. Um, you know, they, one of them asked me to take part in a research project that I never imagined I was qualified for, because, again, first person in my family to go to college, I didn't see myself as any kind of scholar or researcher. But in the course of that research project, I slowly, slowly came to the understanding, oh, I'm actually doing it, you know, 
um, with the mentoring of this professor. Um, and so the, the role of the mentor, I think, is is uh, is absolutely crucial in providing you with those those moments of self insight, which really build on the insight that the mentor has into you. Uh, we, to loop back for a moment we're, to the, when we were talking about a lot of people feeling unseen, unheard, and unworthy, um, what a mentor does is to see you and hear you and let you know you're worthy um, and, and makes an indelible imprint in that regard. And incidentally, um, as someone who's always been interested in education and someone who's written a couple of books on teaching and learning, I've talked with a lot of people, uh, asking them, tell me, tell me a story about a great teacher in your life. And I, almost without fail, they will say something like, this person was a great teacher because he or she saw more in, in me than I saw in myself. So I think that's a pretty universal archetype or motif. Mm-hmm. For sure, I agree. I agree. In in your book, uh, Let Your Life Lead You, or Listen to Your Life, I'm sorry. Let Your Life Speak, right? Thank you. Thank you. We'll get there. I'll get there. Um, You talk about a woman who uh, provided a great realization for you, which really stuck with me, about you were at a place in your life where you didn't feel like doors were opening for you. Right. Yeah. So this woman whose name was Ruth, uh, was uh, a Quaker. She was probably 70 years old or so, and uh, I was in my 40s, I guess. And uh, I was I was floundering. I hadn't pursued a conventional career path, and a lot of people who had expected me to be a young college president or a full professor or something were surprised, even shocked, that I took myself off the academic ladder and started doing things like community organizing. And so, you know, I, people people asked me in later years, you know, why did you why do you think you did that? And I said, well, the only answer I've ever been able to give is at the time I felt like I couldn't not do it. You know, it, it wasn't that I was red hot to take big risks. By that time I was married and had either one, two, or three kids. Um, and and I was making not a whole lot of money, but I couldn't not do it, and and I'm glad I followed that instinct. Anyway, things weren't unfolding, and Quakers, uh, of whom I am now one, uh, have this saying that way will open, uh, way will open, if you you know pay attention to your life and if you if you spend time in silence and if you uh, surround yourself with a, a constructive community of discerning folks. So I went to this Ruth and I said, you know, Ruth, I, I'm really trying hard, have been for some years, but way is not opening for me. And I just remember her laughing, you know, you know, friendly, understanding way and saying, well, Parker, she said, I'm 70 years old. I've been a Quaker since birth, and way has never opened in front of me. But she said, a lot of way has closed behind me, and that's had the same guiding effect. <laughs> uh, and I really treasure that moment because it, I knew it was, I knew the, the truth in what she was saying, but it also gave me an image, and uh, it's an image that I try to share with other people. So the image is, there I was, you know, banging on doors that had closed in my life, right? Two or three, four doors that had closed. I mean, I'd, I was at an age where I was no longer going to become a young college president, and I had done things that took me off the academic ladder, so I wasn't, you know, I wasn't climbing that particular ladder anymore. And I was making not very much money, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of way had closed behind me, but it, it involved, you know, as long as I stood there banging on those three or four doors that had closed, then I was failing to turn around and look at the rest of the world where there are about a million doors that hadn't closed that I could still walk toward and, and walk into. So it, that became a very important image of vocational questing for me. 
Mm -hmm. Very insightful and very important image, I think, for anyone that's thinking about um, changing their life and maybe feeling that same way, that things aren't opening as quickly as they'd like. Mm -hmm. Very astute. And I hope those of you that are out there listening will read this book and experience what you're talking about in Let Your Life Speak. Thank you. Thank you. So do you know what your life purpose is? Well, you know, at age 76, I'm not sure I could have given, given any kind of answer to that question a few years ago, but I, I, at age 76, that's the kind of thing one thinks about a bit more than, uh, than one does when, you know, one's in the, in the white water all the time. I'm still in a lot of white water, but I, I, I have learned over the years to get into the back eddies and, you know, get off the boat for a while and reflect. Um, so um, I, I think one way of putting what my life purpose might be, um, it's always a work in progress. It's always a discovery. Uh, it's not something I don't think I'll ever be able to quite nail down. But I think that, that a red thread running through my life has been the desire to contribute to what I'd call the human possibility. Um, I'm, I'm, I love that phrase, the human possibility, because I think human beings are capable of so much that's good, uh, of creativity, of community, of generosity, of, of grace, of, of mutual support, uh, invention, uh, you know, engaging hard issues of, of justice, speaking truth, to power, uh, speaking the truth in love, um, and, you know, putting yourself on the line for things you value. So the, the human possibility, if you think of it in those ways, can be pursued in religious institutions, educational institutions, homes, neighborhoods, uh, hospitals and healthcare care systems, beginning of life, end of life, and everything in between. Um, and I think my life purpose is probably to make some kind of contribution to enhancing the human possibility. Mm. Mm. So that you're living quite a big life. That's a, a big life. Yeah. And what's interesting, you know, is that um, it's big and it's small because I'm one person uh, with a particular set of gifts. I intersect the world in particular ways, and I think it's always important to recognize that you're holding a paradox. Um, so, you know, if you think of all the people in history, um, maybe either the famous ones or the ones known only to you, who have sort of devoted their lives to high values, to big values, like big things like love, truth, and justice, um, what you realize is that they've devoted themselves to that, to those goals, those values, those ideals, in particular ways, the ways that were available to them, the ways that were within reach, and the ways where uh, the points at which their gifts intersected the needs of the world. So, you know, you have to you have to say, yeah, I'm I'm interested in um, I'm devoted to the human possibility. Um, but um, I also recognize that my own contribution to that um, is finite and limited by the nature of who I am and by the opportunities that I have. It's a way of reminding yourself not to spread yourself too thin. Um, it's a way of reminding yourself that all good things um, happen because of people have taken a million billion small steps. Uh, that's the only way we get to any um, anything big in life at all. One foot in front of the other. You bet. And then looking back 20, 30, 40 years later and saying, "Oh my, look at how far I've come." <laughs> Take a lot of a lot of steps in that 20, yep. 30 yep. years. Felt felt slow and small at the time, but I have traveled a distance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can we talk about religion and spiritual beliefs for a moment? Of course. Yeah. Can you tell us what yours are? 
So I said I'm a Quaker, and one of the reasons I'm, I wasn't born Quaker, I joined when I was in my 40s, and one of the reasons that I was attracted to the Quaker tradition, which is a, it's a small community, relatively speaking, and it's not widely known, although Quakers are known, I think, for their work in reconciliation and uh, in peace activism and racial justice, but probably disproportionately present in, in those events to their very small numbers. But the core beliefs, there are two core beliefs in Quakerism, I think, that attracted me. One is that every person has an inner teacher or an inner light that is one's kind of most immediate and direct access to uh, a truthful voice, um, a voice of discernment about you and about the world. And, and the other paradoxical belief is that it's absolutely critical to be part of a community of discernment because not every voice we hear within ourselves uh, is a voice of truth, uh, is the voice of the inner teacher, not by a long shot. We also have voices of fear and greed and ego, uh, all the things we've talked about earlier in this hour. And so in community, you have a chance to sort of test what you're hearing um, and to sort and sift it with other people. And part of the Quaker discipline is to do that. Um, the Quaker form of religious belief, which which is fund foundationally Christian belief, that's where Quakers came from historically in the mid-17th century England, uh, from as a as a as an effort to reclaim what 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 they thought of as as foundational uh, Christianity. The discipline uh, is not not to tell each other. What, their, what anyone's truth is, but to engage in communal processes of discernment, of sorting and sifting that are very slow, that take time, but that all also, given enough patience, pay off in some very powerful conclusions. I know we don't have enough time left for the whole story, but a quick story. Um, there was a man named John Woolman who lived a hundred years before the Civil War was fought. He had a leading, as Quakers would say, that Quakers should free their slaves. He spent 20 years going up and down the East Coast, um, speaking with other Quakers who were prosperous merchants and farmers who owned slaves and had vested financial interests in enslaving human beings, it took John Woolman 20 years to, for, to persuade Quakers to come to consensus around the immorality, um, the grievous sin of slavery, slaveholding. But he did accomplish that goal after 20 years, and Quakers became the first religious community in the United States to free their slaves en masse. 80 years before the Civil War was fought. Wow. And so when people say, well, that, you know, that kind of discernment and that slow decision making, we got to act on things faster than that. I always ask, you know, is 80 years before the Civil <laughs> War and the Emancipation Proclamation, is that fast enough for you? It, it, we can really get places if we, you know, you, we need to slow down to speed up, I think is one way to put it. You know, that's not the first time that we've talked about that phrase on this podcast, and it's one that I think people need to hear, slowing down to speed to speed up or slowing down to expand time. It's really possible, for sure. It is, absolutely. Amazing opportunities right in front of us that we see to be counterintuitive sometimes. Yeah, and I, I think that's part of what I think of as the human possibility, you know, if we, if we could get out of the frenzy long enough on a regular basis, I think so much would emerge from within us and between us. Wendell Berry, one of my favorite writers, has a poem whose, whose concluding line is, what we need is here. And I really, really believe that it's within us and it's between us. Mm. And um, if we could slow down enough to access and get quiet enough to access what's within us, and then 
take the time to be in community with each other the way this fellow John Woolman was a uh, hundred years before the Civil War, then uh, then I think we can make some tracks. Right. Right. I, it's it's always interesting. I, I work a lot with folks, and I know you have over the years, many, much more than I have, but work on, you know, working with people to develop daily practice or routine practice that slows them down. Um, do you, what is your daily practice? Well, I get up early every morning and I write because writing is a spiritual discipline for me. And it doesn't much matter whether I'm writing a journal entry or um, a thoughtful email to a, a good friend um, or uh, a poem or an essay. It's, it's reflective practice. And frankly, it feeds the, the introvert side of me. Um, I'm sort of 50-50 down the middle on the Myers-Briggs uh, introvert-extrovert thing. Um, and and I need that to balance out the other half of my life, which is in front of audiences and facilitating groups and, you know, doing author-type things. Mm -hmm. um, so writing is part of that. Um, I also like just plain and simple quietude. I like walking in the woods. I live in Madison, Wisconsin, so we have a lot of nice woods around to walk in. And um, I like reading poetry. I read a lot of poetry. I read more poetry and novels than I do, quote, professional literature. Um, people who read my books, they might read a book on education and say, well, you know, where are all the footnotes to all the education literature? And I say, well, they're not here because I don't read it. Um, but I, you'll see a lot of footnotes to poetry and novels and essays and things of that sort that, that sort of feed me at a deeper level. And then you'll see a lot of my own experience reflected as well. Um, so those are some of the things that, um, you know, that, that do, do it for me in terms of bringing me home to myself and getting me more engaged with uh, what I like to call reality. Mm -hmm. Since you mentioned Myers-Briggs, would you share the rest of your Myers-Briggs profile with us? Well, I'm just barely over the the line on, on uh, the EI, right? The extra mm -hmm. yeah. word. So just tweaking myself a little to the E side, I'm an ENFP. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. I, I think that's the typical Myers-Briggs profile. Me too, by the way. When I worked in my corporate job, I tested as an ENTP, but I think that was not so good for me. Mm -hmm. But being in a room of ENFPs is a joyous thing for another ENFP, for sure. Right. <laughs> that's what we're wired to do. Thank you. That's why Thank we like that type. <laughs> that's right. That's why we like that. What do you? Th how about your physical body? You mentioned walking in the woods. Do you think our physical bodies have a play a role in keeping us on point? Absolutely. Um, and I, I have to confess that beyond walking a couple miles every day, I, I'm not a great you know exercise workout person. That's never been part in, of my life. But um, one of the things that I do every year is to spend about a month uh, up in an area of northern Minnesota on the Canadian border called the Boundary Waters, mm. wilderness mm. area, and I love it up there. I love canoeing. I love hiking in the woods, um, and um, and so again, it's it's body and nature. That combination uh, really 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 works for me. But uh, in our work. At the Center for Courage and Renewal, we do talk a lot with our with the facilitators that we prepare for the work uh, about embodiment, and I think that I think that embodiment is a very important word uh, that has to do with all kinds of dimensions of of selfhood. Uh, so, you know, you, the, the the undivided life, uh, which we were talking about earlier is a life in which you embody what you believe. And other people look at you and say, yeah, I think what, you know, more, what we see is what we get. Um, I don't think this is a masked marvel. I don't think he's hiding behind a wall. 
I think he's he's here as he he really is. Um, I mean, one of my um, happiest moments is when people who come to hear me lecture will come up afterwards and say, you know, I've read your books and I've always wondered, is that what you're really like? <laughs> you know, and I say good for them for asking that question. That in person you're like your books. Well, that pleases me because I feel that, you know, that I've come some ways toward that embodiment that I aspire to. But uh, believe me, everything in my life, all the values I hold are aspirational. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> I think everybody is. Mm, agree. Agree. I, I love that you mentioned um, spending a month in nature. If we could, I'd like to go back to that for just a moment. Um, for anyone listening that's never been to the Boundary Waters canoe area, it's a very quiet, very natural place. Um, I've been to Ely. I'm not sure if that's the area that you're talking about, but it stays light, very late, so you spend your time doing different things, I would imagine. Yeah, it's it's really gorgeous. As you know, It's part of it's on the U.S. side, part of it's on the Canadian side, and uh, in, the, in Canada it's called the Quetico. It's a million acres of protected wilderness where no motors no, are allowed, no motorboats are allowed, um, and it's just pristine um, nature. One of the, you know, one of the few, relatively few remaining, uh, pristine, uh, huge pristine plots of, of of nature in this in this country. Uh, and I have, beautiful. I have a friend who offers a. I said once, so what's how would you describe the Boundary Waters? And he said. Uh, he said, everywhere you look, there's a perfect Japanese garden. <laughs> mm. Love that. So it's, you know, it's trees, rocks, water, and sky. And that's it. And and wildlife. Amazing wildlife. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, great practice. Great example of uh, slowing down to catch up for certain. Absolutely. I mean, I spend the other 11 months of the year um dreaming about the Boundary Waters and eager to get back. Mm, I, I can see why. You might have just influenced me to get back up there huh. as well. Good. You've mentioned money a couple times in your life. What would you say to those listening um, that feel like they might not be able to make enough money following their truer self? Well, I, I can certainly say that you know money was an issue for me for a number of years. I mean, here's something that might interest people along those lines, a story about being a father and then also a husband, a father, and pursuing uh, an off-brand career that was not financially remunerative. So after five years of community organizing, I went to a, pen, uh, to a, a place called Pendle Hill, which is near Philadelphia, it's a Quaker living learning community slash adult study center that was founded in 1930. It's still there. Great place um, where adult students come to live and study with a staff, a resident community of about 35 people. So at full strength, we were about 70 people sharing a daily round of life, meals, Quaker silent worship, silent meeting in the morning, um, physical work, taking care of the place, decision-making, uh, consensus style, and, and study uh, in a variety of areas. I was dean of studies there, um, and I had a teaching staff of about seven people and a curriculum uh, that ran three terms a year, and a full participant, uh, as everyone was, in all of those dimensions of Common, of the common life. When I was at Pendle Hill, and I was there for 11 years, um, from 1974 to 1985, everybody made the same base salary. So it didn't matter that I had a PhD from Berkeley and I was Dean of Studies. I made the same base salary as the young person who came 
to cook in the kitchen at age 18 or work in the garden because they didn't know what to do after high school. And that salary in 1974 um, was uh, $2,400 a year plus room and board. Um, and I cranked those numbers a few years back and found out that in, in the dollars of, of, of more recent years, that would have been about $10,000. Mm. And I, I asked my, I kind of laughed as I asked myself, do you think you could find a Berkeley PhD today who would be willing to work for $10,000 a year at a funky place like Pendle <laughs> Hill? So I, I wrestled with the whole question at that time of, of, you know, how, how can I do this and still be a responsible dad for three kids? I mean, I got help going through college. I'd like to give my kids that help if that's what they need. And what I finally came to was that, uh, was that, um, the most important thing I could give my kids was not, um, enough money saved up for them to go to college when they were 18, because what if they decided not to do that? I would be so angry about having left something I loved um, to uh, sacrifice myself um, uh, so that they could go to college, only for them to decide that's not what they wanted to do. The most important thing I could give my kids was a model of following one's best leadings, you know, following one's North Star, following one's calling, identity and integrity, vocation, whatever you want to call it, and that, that that ultimately would be more important to them than anything else. The, the second thing that happened there at Pendle Hill, and I realized this only looking back, was that because I was making very little money as the dean of studies there, uh, although loving, loving it, and it was a transformational decade plus in my life, um, but because uh, I was making very little money, I turned to writing and speaking as an additional source of income. And I doubt very much that I would have done the heavy lifting involved in writing a book, which has always been a challenge for me, um, if I hadn't in some sense felt compelled to do that. And yet it was the writing and the speaking that, after I left Pendle Hill, allowed me to establish an independent career. And I've been working independently ever since 1985. Um, and the writing, you know, was with nine books out there that are still in print and keep selling. Um, that brings in an income. The speaking and the, the workshopping and so forth brings in an income, although I, um, I, uh, I've I, I volunteer my services for the Center for Courage and Renewal um, simply because I, I want to and, and am able to. But if I do a job for a university or a foundation or something of that sort, then I can you know, charge a decent fee. So what I ended up doing at Pendle Hill was, in a, in a sense, being compelled to, to chart out a path that eventually became um, an independent work for me that I'm doing to this day. So what can we say? It's interesting the way life works out. Mm -hmm. And one more question on that topic. Would you say that you have everything that you need? Oh, for sure, because I figured out a long time ago that abundance has nothing to do with cash in the bank. It has everything to do with friendship, with community, with meaningful work, uh, with um, a feeling of being at home in the world and appreciating the world and of being at home in your own skin and, uh, you know, valuing your life experience. So abundance abounds in that sense for me. Mm, very beautiful. Thank you for that. May I ask you a lightning round of yes or no short answer questions? You bet, Angie. Do you think that passion and purpose are the same things? Um, not necessarily, although I think they can, they, they can and, and should overlap. Okay. Do you think everybody has a life purpose? Yes. 
Me too. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being high, how important is following your joy in igniting your purpose? It depends. <laughs> Sorry to break the That's okay. simple answer format, but, you know, I think uh, when I'm able to do it, I like I like to max out at 10 um, in following my joy uh, to pursue my purpose. There are times when, at the beginning anyway, um, it doesn't feel like you're following your joy, but there's a sense of of duty or obligation or commitment. I mean, if you are running a nonprofit, for example, or you're helping to support a nonprofit, as I am, um, there are things that come along that really aren't quite in your wheelhouse, but for the sake of the greater good, you do them anyway. Um, and eventually you, you see, oh, okay, that too was a contribution to something um, that brings me joy. Mm -hmm. Excellent point. Do you think that somebody needs to quit their job to follow their purpose? Um, not necessarily. I've known people who who had to do that um, because they were in jobs that were really, really um, smothering their souls. Mm -hmm. um, but I've known others who were able to carve out meaningful arenas of work within the institution. I'm glad they did because they they brought they bring they brought um, very valuable um, gifts to that to that institution. Mm -hmm. But they needed they needed to create, as it were, safe zone within the institution. Uh, to pursue their purposes. Thank you. What brings you great, great joy? Uh, laughter does. Uh, writing does. Um, hanging out with people I love does. Walking in the woods and paddling a canoe on a lake in the Boundary Waters does. Finding a, a great poem to post on my Facebook author page or just to enjoy for myself. So many things do. I mean, I I get up early in the morning, and uh, the room I walk into um, has an east-facing window. And so often there's a, an amazing incipient sunrise on the horizon. You know, it's still dark, but there's a red glow across the horizon if it's not clouded over. And I'll just stand there for three or four or five minutes just feeling the joy of, of another day of life and being able to see that kind of simple beauty. Mm. Mm. If you, it's hard to go on to a next question after that picture. You just, I just want to linger there for a few moments. If you unexpectedly amassed a good-sized fortune, what would you do differently? Um, I can't think of a thing I'd do differently, truly. Um, I, uh, I just, I feel so blessed by the fact that, uh, 40 years ago, I was able to, um, start working largely independently, uh, as a writer and traveling teacher, and then to establish a nonprofit that, uh, has, uh, has given me so many colleagues. Um, whose, whose friendship and, and whose, whose work I, I value so very much. So I really can't think of a thing I, I would do differently. I mean, I, I'd keep going to the Boundary Waters, <laughs> you know. I'd, I'd, I'd keep doing, I'd keep getting up early. I'd keep writing. Uh, um, I, uh, there, I, I can't think of anything that I would, uh, any point or place in my life where I feel Oh, if only I had enough money, I, I would mm -hmm. love to do that. Mm, thank you. So in closing, what should listeners learn from your life? Well, I think I confess that it, it feels a little cocky to say that, they, 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 that there's anything in that sense to learn from my life, although when I write books, um, I obviously think, well, maybe there's something that I can toss into the pond that, Something will, the, the ripple of which will, uh, will reach someone in a, in a positive, life-giving way. But I guess 
The thing I want to say, and I, I'll steal this from spiritual teachers much greater, much, much greater than I, um, I is um, the thing to learn from from anyone's life, if, if you decide that you admire that life, is to live your own life, which is what that person has done. Um, mm. I, I think it's really as simple as that. Um, you, you know, you are the only you that there is. Uh, you are unique in your giftedness and in your in the way you intersect the world. So it's it's up to each of us to um, to find that that place. Um, uh, the writer Frederick Beekner, uh, a great writer, once said that uh, you find your calling at the po- at the point where where your uh, deep joy meets the world's deep need. Um, I I believe that, and I believe that that's a different place of intersection for each each one of us. So, if there's a life that you admire, I think the takeaway always is. Um, that person lived his or her own, so you should live your own. Mm, mm, very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. What what a delicious interview. I could talk to you for hours and hours. Before we close, I'd, I'd love to give people a way to learn more about you. Would you like to tell us your website and your Facebook page? Sure. The website, uh, you can Google the Center for Courage and Renewal but, uh, and get there quickly. The website is courage rene- couragerenewal, one word, dot O-R-G. Uh, you can also go to Facebook and put in Parker J. Period Palmer and find my Facebook author page where actually the the picture I use is of me in the boundary waters with a a slicker and a cap on looking very happy. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, uh, so it's just Parker J. Palmer on Facebook uh, for my author page. And and he does share some beautiful poetry and inspirational things on his page, so I'd encourage you to go out there and like his page and visit. Well, thank you. And then um, you can go to Amazon and find uh, my nine books. You'll probably find more than that because I've written four words and so forth that sometimes pop up when you search my name on Amazon. But I have an author page there, um, and I'm especially, as I said earlier, interested in, in pointing people toward my most recent book, which is called Healing the Heart of Democracy. Uh, it's readily available on Amazon. Just make sure that you, you get the, the new paperback edition, which came out last year. Uh, the book originally came out in 2011. So there's a 2014 paperback that has a new introduction and uh, a study guide at the back with all kinds of online links to videos I've done and and exercises that can be used by uh, individuals and small groups to get deeper into the book. Well, I have to ask you, are any other books on the horizon that you're writing currently? (laughs) Yeah, I'm, I'm actually starting to work slowly as I always do on a book that was in, that's, that's inspired by a couplet, a little poem from Thoreau that I read many, many years ago and that has always kind of stayed with me in, in a, in, it's not Walden, his famous book, but it's another book he did called a week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, uh, he has a page on the life of the artist, the writer, the poet, but really talking, I think, about the art of living generally. And in the middle of that page, there's this little couplet that reads, my life has been the poem I would have writ, Mm. I could not both live and utter it. That just fascinates me. My life has been the poem I, I would have writ, but I could not both live and utter it. And so I'm writing a book called The Poem I Would Have Writ. Mm, mm. The main uh, thesis in the book is that 
Um, we can learn a lot about the qualities of a good life from the qualities of a good poem. So I'm not talking about the content of the poem, but about the qualities of good poetry. Quick example. A, a good poem uh, is a way of, uh, gives us a way to hold something that's mysterious uh, without killing it, you know, without nailing it down or chloroforming it or pinning it in a box, um, but still holding it in a way that allows us to walk around it and look into that mystery, treat it respectfully, but but still learn more about it or even have a chance to enter into it. That's That's what good poetry does for us, and I think that's a quality that a good life requires as well. Uh, we get in so much trouble in this world, uh, and this would take us into a much larger conversation about religion in our society, but I think we get in so much trouble in this world by <clears throat> taking things that you know, should be treated as, as mystery and as poetry and trying to nail them down into fixed and frozen beliefs and positions so, and then commence to fight over them. Um, and that just isn't serving us very well. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm really enjoying just the beginnings of this getting this book underway um, and identifying eh, probably eight or ten qualities of good poetry that I think we can uh, from which I think we can learn about a good life. Mm -hmm. Well, when that book is ready, I hope you'll come back and talk to us about what you found out while writing it, and I'm sure what will be a very, very rich look into life and poetry. Well, thank you, Angie. I'd, l I'd love to come back. I've enjoyed our time together very, very much. Me too. Me too. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. I hope you will all go out and investigate further the work of Parker J. Palmer. Your life will be changed and inspired. Thank you so much for joining us today here on the Life Purpose Advisor podcast. We know that your time is limited and your life is busy. So we thank you so much for joining us and spending this hour with us today. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. And if you'd like more help in finding your own life purpose, please visit us at www.lifepurposeadvisor.com. Have a wonderful day.